Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the day two of the fourth Padaranga Varela Memorial Lecture. We thank everyone who is joining us today. And once again, I'm Attorney Christina Alcantara, trustee of FEF, and I'll be your host and moderator. As you all know, the Padaranga Varela Memorial Lecture was launched in 2016 on FEF's 20th anniversary to honor our late co-founders, Dr. Cayetano Padaranga Jr. and Mr. Francisco Varela. Last week, February 3, we featured FEF's proposed agricultural reforms for the post-pandemic period. We also heard from Dr. Philip Mitalia on his economic outlook. And for today's session, we'll continue on the reforms and present the proposed reforms for the labor sector. But of course, before we uh, start all that, uh, let me allow first to acknowledge and thank our generous sponsors for making this event possible. Special thanks to the support of Atlas Network. And also thank you to our major sponsors, Aboitis Ventures, Bank of the Philippine Islands, Meralco Water Company, sorry, Mandela Water Company, Meralco, Subdivision and Housing Developers Association, Shantan. And thank you also for our minor sponsors, Ayala Land Incorporated, Convergence Realty and Development Corporation, First Asia Venture Corporation, Philippine Veterans Bank, Malati Construction and Development Corporation, Organization of Socialized and Economic Housing Developers of the Philippines, Philippine Wood Producers Association, Pro Friends, Regina Capital, Rizal Commercial Banking Corporation, and Stratcom Corporation. Of course, we'd also like to thank our media partners, Thank you to Business World, Inquirer Net, and Inquirer Pop. Before I start their webinar, let me give you a few reminders. So for our Zoom participants, you may use the Zoom Q&A for your questions. For other comments and insights, you may type them in the chat box. So remember, you use the Zoom Q&A so I can leave your questions later. For our Facebook participants, you may post your questions or comments on the comments section of the live stream, and we'll try our best to accommodate your questions during the open forum. We invite you also to participate in a short poll to be launched after the main presentation. And at the end, we'd like to hear your thoughts on the seminar or the webinar. A link will be shared in the chat box. For anyone who you will be needing this, a certificate of attendance will also those will be also be provided for everyone. And a reminder, the webinar is being recorded for documentation purposes. The event is also live streamed in our face official Facebook page, Foundation for Economic Freedom. So good reminder, we encourage everyone to share your insights and thoughts on social media and use the official event hashtags, such so hashtag PVML2021. And for today's webinar, it's hashtag labor reforms. So uh, let's start off. We'd like to uh, do a short poll just to check on how everyone is doing today. So maybe like uh, like me, you may need a bit of coffee. So there's a morning survey. So uh, please answer. So we'd like to know how you're doing so far. Okay. I hope everyone is voting. I think last week uh, we had a... Uh, uh, some people tuning in from Washington, D.C. and Hong Kong, and I hope you're still tuning in. And also from, uh, you may also check our chat box from time to time. Uh, the, uh, pro the program or some of the materials are also uploaded there. All right. I hope everyone has answered the survey. Okay, so 72% of the uh, participants uh, answered it's all right. And... Uh, We'd actually like to borrow some of the energy of those 23%. So good for you guys. Good morning. And some 5% uh, need a bit of coffee. So maybe I'll take my coffee after this break. Thanks, everyone, for participating. All right. So now moving to our main event. To deliver the main presentation on FEF's proposed labor reforms, we have three FEF fellows. For our first main presenter is Dr. Vicente Paqueo. Vic Paqueo is a Distinguished Visiting Research Fellow at the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. He is also a member of the Board of Trustees of the Social Weather Station and a consultant of the World Bank, ADB, 
ADRI Stratface and Institute of Poverty Action. So our second fellow will be the second speaker for the day is Dr. Aniceto Orbeta Jr. He's also a senior research fellow at the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. He's also a professional lecturer at the School of Economics of the University of the Philippines. And our third main presenter is Secretary Gary Olivar, who is the director for the Center for Strategy, Enterprise, and Intelligence, which provides strategic research and advisories to selected public and private organizations. He presently also consults at and with the DILD Center for Federalism and Constitutional Reform, where he helped draft a new federal and parliamentary constitution. So aside from our main uh, FEF fellows who will be presenting, we also invited some uh, members or, or panelists who will also be giving their comments. And of course, with the presenters, we also have the members of the FEF labor work stream who have worked tirelessly since lockdown started to prepare a well-researched and consulted labor market reform process. So with, uh, before we start everything, I'd also like to introduce our panel of reactors, our discuss discussants, and they will each have five to seven minutes to share their insights. Our first discussant is Assistant Secretary Dominic Rubia Tutay, who is also the concurrent director of the Bureau of Local Employment. She heads the bureau responsible for promoting full and decent employment through policy and program development. Currently, she is engaged in measures to mitigate the employment impact of COVID-19, particularly on measures included in the Dole Employment Recovery Plan, which we'll also hear about later. Our second discussant is Mr. Antonio Sayo, who is a member of the Board of Governors of the Employers' Confederation of the Philippines. He is also the private sector representative of the National TVET Trainers Academy. He had various consultancies work on education, health, land use, labor, food and agribusiness with various national and foreign government agencies. And for our third discussant, we'll be joined by Mr. Clark Nebrao, the chairman of the Association of Laguna Food Processors. He is, the forefront, he is at the forefront of innovation as an international eco-socialpreneur, mixologist, financial planner, life-affirming specialist, motivational book author, food connoisseur, and pioneer home growth ASEAN mentor. So for the final discussant, we have Representative Stella Luz Kimbo of the 2nd District of Marikina. He's currently Deputy Minor, Minority Leader and Co-Chair of the House's Defeat COVID-19 Pandemic Economics the News Cluster. Representative Stella Luz Kimbo is an academician, served as Professor and Department Chair of the University of the Philippines School of Economics. In 2016, she was appointed Commissioner of the Philippine Competition Commission, where she served for three years. So this is our line of speakers, speakers and discussions for today. I hope you put in your question in the chat box should you have any questions and we'll read them out later. So I'll turn it over now to the labor team for their presentation. The last 10 years prior to the advent of the COVID-19 pandemic saw the Philippine economy grew at a sustained rate of over 6%. Remarkably, economic growth became more inclusive with poverty rate declining from 23.5% to 16.6% and, and employment and underemployment rates uh, reduced to their lowest um, in contemporary history. The expectation, therefore, according to Economic Planning Secretary Ernesto Pernia was that the Philippines was poised to become an upper middle income country in 2020. Sadly, that did not happen as the economy went into the recession as shown in the chart um, provided by Deputy Governor Diwa Ginagundo. Next, please. That economic growth was getting more inclusive is supported by survey data from SWS. Dr. Marma has presented this interesting chart showing that there were increasingly more gainers from economic growth than losers until this progress in, in inclusivity collapsed in 2020 due to the COVID-19 pandemic. This diagram 
lays out a model showing stylized pathways through which key factors and policy instruments directly and indirectly generate more employment, improve workers' wages and benefits, and ultimately reduce poverty and increase inclusion. The model highlights the factors that we argue are key determinants of those desired outcomes. These factors include labor productivity growth. This productivity factor, we further argue, is driven in turn by one, accumulation of human capital produced by education, training, and work experience. Two, accumulation of physical capital like tools, equipment, and buildings. Three, advances in knowledge and technology. And fourth, government policies, programs, and labor market regulations. On the latter, these government interventions can facilitate or unintentionally impede achievement of desired labor market outcomes. In the next slides, we will discuss empirical findings to illustrate the need for a dialogue on labor market related policies and regulation, regulatory reforms to facilitate generation of better paying jobs. This diagram further highlights the potential of two types of programs that can potentially generate jobs and incomes for workers and businesses. These programs referred to one government funded build, build, build infrastructure activities and two temporary employment subsidy programs. In the next slides, I will present some stylized facts about the Philippine labor market. In this slide, we see that basic real wage shown by the gray line is roughly constant despite rising labor productivity as measured by GDP per worker shown by the orange line. Contrary to what conventional economics teaches, real wage does not appear to rise with labor productivity. It would appear that workers have not benefited from productivity in increases, therefore. This view has led influential commentators to conclude that A, capitalists are exploiting workers by robbing them of their just share of increased productivity, and that B, there is a need for government to raise legal minimum wages and workers' benefits. The problem with this conclusion is that the basic wage indicator is only part of the workers' total remuneration. If we look at the blue line, which include basic wages and benefits, the story looks different. Total remuneration per worker rises with labor productivity as expected, contrary to anti-capitalist rhetoric. These two graphs point to the importance of focusing attention on Philippine productivity growth and physical capital accumulation to raise remuneration per worker. Specifically, the bar chart shows how far the Philippines is lagging behind our aspirational peers in regard to labor productivity. The regression equation further indicates that a 10% increase in labor pr productivity is associated with a rise in compensation per worker of about 6.5%, and B, a 10% increase in capital per worker is associated with a 36% increase in compensation. In this table, we present the associated percentage change in selected outcomes with respect to a percentage differential in regional productivity, measured as regional gross value added per worker. This table presents the associated percentage change in selected outcomes with respect to percentage differential in regional productivity, measured as regional gross value added per worker. The table further indicates the percentage improvements in workers' wages and other outcomes associated with a 10% differential in regional labor productivity. In the next table, we illustrate regulations that contribute to making the Philippines more costly, less, effect, less efficient, and less flexible. 
Specifically, the table shows the following findings. One, compared to regional peers and most other countries, the Philippines ranks low in terms of labor market efficiency, number 91 out of 144. Indonesia ranks lower than the Philippines. Remarkably, however, President Widodo recently approved an omnibus reform of Indonesia's labor code. It is likely that in future data updates, Indonesia would rank better in labor market efficiency than the Philippines. The labor market efficiency score consists of the following components. One, hiring and firing practices. Two, redundancy costs. Three, flexibility in wage determination. And fourth, the ratio of legal minimum wages to average value added per worker, which appears to be the highest among selected peers and competitors. On employment demand by large enterprises, but a negative effect on the employment of uh, small scale enterprises. Overall, high Legal minimum wages reduce the overall employment rate and hours of work. Legal minimum wages adversely impact the employment rate of disadvantaged groups of workers, particularly the women, young, and less educated workers, which on average have less market relevant work experience and human capital. Disconcertingly, more rapid increase in legal minimum wages lead to lower family income and higher poverty rate. Looking ahead, it is critical to recognize the inevitable changes in the global environment and the need to adapt our mindset and approaches to labor market issues if you want to flourish in the age of the fourth industrial revolution. The fourth industrial revolution has the following salient features. One, increase productivity and reduce production and distribution costs. Widespread adoption of efficient labor saving innovations. Third, constant reskilling, upskilling, and updating of knowledge. Enterprises and business models are being created, discarded, and reconfigured. And therefore, new jobs will be created constantly and existing jobs destroyed and reconfig reconfigured, resulting in high labor turnover. Um, the implication of this fourth industrial revolution is that countries need to modernize their labor codes. In the Philippines, we need systematically to review existing policies and regulations as soon as possible, including the review of labor code, the labor code. We need to agree on how to ensure that workers, employers, and government will have the needed flexibility and capacity to survive and flourish under the fourth industrial revolution. We need to think together on how to improve the economic security of workers and their families, as job turnovers accelerate with the unfolding of the fourth industrial revolution. Finally, we need to rebalance government control and restrictions and freedom and flexibility to flourish in the fourth industrial revolution. I now give the floor to Dr. Beta and then Gary Oliver. Okay, despite being acknowledged as the best form of training, enterprise-based training output is extremely low in the country. The most recent estimate from the data of TESTA shows that this is less than 4% of the total training output. With the fourth industrial revolution, there will be faster job destruction and job creation, which will require continuous training as workers move from one job to the next. The best training, as mentioned, is enterprise-based training. So what are the benefits of uh, uh, enterprise-based training. This can be viewed uh, from several uh, from perspective of the three participants. The apprentice intern or OGT 
uh, which I will be using will be using interchangeably, benefit from the training by facilitating their employment. It's particularly true for those with weak or uncertain paper qualifications. Uh, the training will be a good venue for to reveal uh, for them to reveal the uh, to the prospective employers what they can do. For firms, uh, the benefit from the training through a, a short system of a, a short stream of more productive workers coming out of the training, uh, which they themselves conducted. Firms too will have the first hand information on the workplace attitude of the trainee. This will serve as an effective screening mechanism for them. For society, benefits come from facilitating employment of otherwise would be unemployed workers. It also benefits from more productive workers and firms. This is the public good component of an infirm training. What are the issues on, on of uh, uh, infirm training? I will, let, let me run down. Uh, first, the question of whether apprenticeship or internship is a work or training. Workers want it to be treated as work and be paid full wages. Firms, on the other hand, want it to be treated as training uh, and workers be given training allowance lower than the minimum wage. The firms have been accused of abusing apprenticeship as a form of getting around the minimum wage law. Uh, then there is the issue of the length of the apprenticeship. Workers want it to be short as possible and be treated as regular workers as soon as possible. Firms, on the other hand, want it to be long as possible to continue to enjoy uh, lower than minimum wage and deductibility of expenses. Our proposal is to declare apprenticeship as, or internship as training, which will resolve many of these issues. As training, it will have a specified curriculum, a specified training period, and an assessment and certification, just like any training. This can be agreed to by both the, appren the apprentice or intern uh, and the firms prior to engagement. It will be governed by existing training regulations like any other training supervised by TESTA. This way, it will provide the principle of solving such issues as content, which is the curriculum, the period, which should not be fixed for all types of training, like six months, but depend on what is required for the training. This also resolves the next issue of payment fee or allowance, however you will call it. Uh, the current practice is to pay 75% of the minimum wage as payment for or allowance. But I would like to submit that by agreeing to get 75% of the minimum wage, the trainee effectively contributes 25% to his own training. Explicitly recognizing the contribution of the trainee also recognizes his stake in his own training. In terms of direct training costs, since infirm training has a public good component, as mentioned earlier, it's also worthy for public subsidy in the form of reimbursement of the training costs. You have heard uh, uh, from firms that getting this reimbursement uh, is very costly, discouraging them from participating in, uh, in firm training. This needs to be addressed. The current bills propose deductibility of from 50 to 75% of direct training costs. Finally, there is the question of uh, hiring after training. Workers obviously want to be hired as regular workers after the apprenticeship or, or internship. Firms, on the other hand, wants to have the option to hire only those that are a good fit to their requirements. Our recommendation is not, is, is not to make this a mandatory, uh, make this mandatory and give the option to firms and to apprentices as well, the choice to enter into an employment agreement after a training uh, or not. If the apprentice is not hired, he has a certificate that will help him find a job elsewhere. The next logical question is what's the role of government in infirm training? Government should invest in this type of training since this is, as mentioned, there is, this is, there is a public good component of the training, namely facilitating employment and preparing workers with better skills uh, required by firms and making firms more productive. This constitutes one or, or more of the effective uses of government money. This can be in the form of funding, a funding the cost of uh, uh, apprenticeship and training, such as inside or uh, uh, offsite uh, portions of the apprenticeship. B uh, payments of the contribution to social protection systems, as people may want this to be 
we want the apprentice to be uh, protected by uh, existing social protection systems. And C, incentives for apprentice to finish, who finishes his training and for employers who employ their apprentices upon completion. So to uh, uh, incentivize either uh, completing or hiring of, of, of uh, trainees after they completed. And the last one is employment facilitation support for those who cannot be hired by, by the existing employers. Now, if you look at this, there are other issues that you have to find, uh, to, have to think about. You may have noticed that the apprenticeships and, or job start laws are intended for new entrants. But with the fourth industrial revolution, there is a need for continuing training, even for higher level skills. The firms will have the, be the best venue for these types of training as well. This is particularly true for cutting edge technologies that form part of the competitive advantage of firms. There is a need to provide incentives for this type of training as well, not just for uh, uh, new uh, workers. Now, let me turn to the unemployment insurance issue. The desired objective of unemployment or employment insurance is to improve income security as opposed to protecting current jobs uh, through such policies as anti-contractualization or sec security of tenure policies. Protecting current jobs will increasingly become difficult to achieve given rapid changes in the labor market. We submit that it is in rapidly changing labor markets, facilitating re-employment or preparing for the next job is a superior strategy than protecting current employment. The preferred strategy, overall strategy is unemployment insurance with a strong assistance to find next employment. Unemployment insurance alone will only provide temporary income support. Uh, with strong assistance to find the next employment, the unemployment spell, spells and income flow disruptions will be shorter, which hits two important objectives. A, better outcomes for workers, and B, improves the viability of the plan. Uh, in some countries, such as Canada and Korea and Japan, where strong re-employment assistance is included in unemployment insurance, the colder program employment insurance rather than unemployment insurance. You can tell that the drift of the recommendation is for more employment rather than unemployment insurance. Let us now go through the main issues of employment or unemployment insurance. First one is coverage. A social insurance scheme, ideally, uh, coverage will be for all workers is desired to spread the risk of unemployment. But in most programs, the coverage is limited to formal sector workers because of the challenge of collecting from informal sector workers and in determining eligibility for self for the self-employed. Insurance schemes usually want it to be compulsory to avoid self-selection issues. Uh, that is, uh, only those who are have high risk of unemployment will to participate. The second issue is eligibility for payment of benefits. There is no controversy here, as there is a universal agreement that this should cover only involuntary unemployment. The controversy perhaps is on the uh, on the minimum requirements before eligibility. There is always a uh, that provision of minimum number of months of contribution before becoming eligible. The third is on benefits. Early unemployment insurance pro programs uh, only include income replacements, which usually is a proportion of the previous income. The level uh, in the proportion of the previous income and the length of benefits vary from program to program. Increasingly, more and more schemes include assistance to find the next employment. This can come in the form of training assistance and employment facilitations, among others. This is an especially important component for unemployment employment insurance schemes, particularly from the objective of income security. The assistance reduces the length of unemployment spell and consequently the disruptions of flow of income. Employment benefits necessarily cannot be given for long periods without threatening the viability of the fund. The fourth is financing. This usually comes from the contribution of workers, employers, and government. Contribution can come from all the three or some of the three. The ILO survey says that the U.S., except for three states, has no employers contribu employ uh, workers' contribution. Uh, Denmark, on the other hand, uh, does not have employers' employers contribution to cite the extremes. Finally, in administration, there are three separate functions in unemployment employment insurance schemes, namely the collection of the contribution, 
processing of application of members and claims and payments of benefits. This can uh, be separated as, as a tax agency in charge for collecting contribution, a social security office collecting and or processing uh, applications, while a payment, a payment of benefits can be done by some other institutions or all the functions will be done in one institution. Now let's go to the description of the current program. Next slide, please. The current program uh, is in, in as, as uh, Congressperson Kimbo described it, is, 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 in, uh, is, is fragmented. You have like uh, the newly introduced unemployment insurance in private sector workers, which has added to the benefits of the SSS in RA 11199 or the Social Security Act of 2018 signed into law in February 7, 2019. There is a GSIS similar program for permanent workers of civil servants under its uh, Act of 1977, RA 8291. It pays, both pays 50% uh, of creditable salary for SSS or average monthly salary for GSIS for two months. Uh, the labor code also has a severance pay, uh, which is uh, at least one month or one month for each year of employment, whichever is higher. Pagi big members can avail uh, of a loan of up to 80% of their accumulated savings. In terms of employment facilitation, there is a uh, general employment facilitation program of government via the Public Employment Service Office. As you can see, these programs are in different uh, offices or institutions. That's why uh, Congressperson Kimbo Stella said that these are fragmented and uh, more importantly, there's no explicit three employment insurance assistance component uh, in, in the existing program, which leaves this task to the general employment facilitation of government in PESO, as mentioned. Now let's look at the uh, uh, Congressperson's uh, Kimbo's proposal, proposed bill. Uh, it has the, uh, the compulsory provisions for formerly employed workers and voluntary participations for self-employed and uh, informal workers. The contributions come from government, both uh, all the three, government, employer, and employee, contributing 44.5% uh, of monthly salaries for each of them, totaling to 13.5%. It will pay up to 80% of the salary for three months, which is uh, obviously higher than the current schemes. The one that I like best is the provision for training, training allowance and job counseling assistance, which is absent in the current scheme. It, it proposes that ECCS operate it for the first five years, then a job insurance corporation of field jobs will be created to take over the operations. An endowment fund will be created to subsidize the premium of the contribution of workers and uh, employers for the first year of the operation as an economic stimulus and a reserve fund will be created for intertemporal risk pooling. The UI proposal of Congressperson Kimbo has many of the desired features uh, mentioned earlier and should be supported. As I've already mentioned, I particularly like the employment assistance feature, uh, which is critical to improve income security and not, uh, uh, not present in the current scheme. There is a challenge, of course, of collecting premium from informal sector workers and determining unemployment incidence for self-employed workers. But this, these are perhaps minor issues. Now let's go to the uh, pension reform to complete the FAF, uh, Labor Market Reform Advocacy. We draw from the work of FAF fellow, fellows associated with the institutions mentioned at the bottom of the slide as is responsible for the proposal. We are mentioning it here, hoping that we would draw out the proponents among the fellows to provide the details later in the question and answer portion. Uh, the multi-pillar pension framework of the World Bank envisions pillar one as a mandatory public pension, such as SSS and GSIS, and pillar two as the mandatory occupational or, or personal pension uh, with employers, and pillar three as the voluntary occupational or personal pension plans. It has the feature of the voluntary system that allows individuals, but it also allows individuals to top up mandated public and employment-based uh, pensions according to the preference of the pensioner. This is very important because people 
have different views of how they want to live uh, in retirement. Without a well-developed pension system, many will face a lack of income support issues upon retirement. The analysis of the group identifies the main weakness that that main weakness of the system is that it's basically an unfunded scheme. An unfunded scheme uh, uh, will depend on the resources of the source of funding, e.g. government or the firm, and will not address the differing needs of uh, the pensioners. It also lacks portability with long vesting period of five to 20 years when millennials uh, changes employers in three to five years. I can mention my son who is in the labor market for less than 10 years and has worked for five different employers. It also has the undesirable feature of RA 7641, which has the provision that the payment to the pension benefits rest on the final employer. If the company goes bankrupt, the pensioner will lose the benefit as well. Finally, the pension benefits are low and will mean poverty in old age for many pensioners. The recommendation of the group is to include a discussion of portability of pension benefits in a tripartite dialogue. Good day, everyone. It's certainly a uh, great privilege for me to follow in the footsteps of my distinguished colleagues like Dr. Pakeo and Dr. Orbeta. I hope I will uh, do justice to being in their company. Uh, I'm assigned to talk uh, today, first of all, about uh, the concept of special employment zones, uh, which is among the reforms that are being pushed by the uh, uh, second work stream uh, among the three work streams set up by the FEF no, to look at uh, what ought to be the reform agenda this year. No? Special uh, employment zones, the major features of this, employment promotion zones, are number one, within those zones, we, we will have flexibility in minimum wage and tenure arrangements, okay? which is part of the, uh, the uh, opening up of labor markets that we hope to demonstrate within these zones. Another major feature is that the tenure, tenure of employment is determined by competency programs or certifications, which are regularly reviewed and renewed. Thirdly, the, uh, within the zones, uh, there will be the provision of grants, subsidies, or incentives to employers setting up businesses within the zone and training or upskilling employees. And lastly, there shall be a development commissioner in place to oversee that labor standards are being met within the zones. Okay. What are the alternative designs available to us? Okay. Uh, number one is to set up a zone, an employment promotion zone. Uh, uh, in high density or high unemployment areas where it can draw on uh, where they where labor intensive uh, locators can uh, can draw on an available pool of relatively low skilled labor in the area a good example would be for example setting up a garments uh, plant uh, near the tondo foreshore area that's been suggested a second possible design is to uh, set up a uh, greenfield project in a low density area that will attract locators and migrant employees. Okay, here, the development of infrastructure is critical. As a matter of fact, one of the fellows in FEF is proposing to incorporate this design within his own plans for setting up uh, uh, special zones in uh, the southern provinces, south, south of Metro Manila. The third possibility and perhaps the most attractive will be to set out or to carve out subzones from within existing uh, PESA export or economic zones. Of course, that is the advantage of already having existing structure, existing infrastructure, as well as market presence, and of course, an existing pool of locators. A special case I should mention is that uh, the Bank Samara government has expressed willingness to FEF, not during visits that we have made to, uh, to talk to their government, to talk to the leadership. The government there has indicated they are willing to make the entire autonomous region of Bank Samoro an export slash employment, unemployment slash employment slash economic zone. Okay. Uh, that way, uh, it, you know, it becomes obviously a good uh, uh, demonstration of, uh, of the uh, potential of uh, opening up economic markets 
within what is probably the most un underdeveloped region in the country, as well as one that, uh, as we know, has just come out of uh, uh, decades no? of strife, civil strife. What are the advantages with this uh, uh, approach? Okay, number one, we hope to accelerate investment and employment opportunities through these zones. Number two, if these zones turn out to be successful at generating investment and employment, it could provide the basis for nationwide adoption of the labor market reforms over time that will be tested out in these zones. And thirdly, and not the least important, uh, it will be uh, these zones uh, ought to be uh, uh, an innovation that we can get organized labor to agree to, despite our likely differences in philosophy, because these reforms we will be implementing are clearly firewalled behind the zone boundaries. All right. Uh, so what, have the, what are the themes of this, we've discussed so far in today's uh, uh, memorial lectures uh, that have been discussed, uh, especially by the two preceding speakers? Number one is uh, the importance of labor productivity growth. It's a necessary ingredient to long-term expansion of employment and a rise in the average workers' remuneration. Both workers and capitalists stand to benefit from productivity growth contrary to anti-capitalist claims. Secondly, importance of investment in human capital. Investments in physical capital as well as knowledge are key to sustained expansion of more gainful employment. Number three, government investment. Okay. It's important for lowering the cost of the business, raising productivity growth, and therefore expanding long-term employment and wages. Government may also be the source of subsidies for enterprises and cash for work programs that can generate temporary jobs. These, of course, are, are important considerations, especially as you're coming out of a uh, pandemic lockdown and you're moving to get back to economic recovery. Fourthly, the importance of the issue of labor regulations. Okay. Properly issued, properly managed, labor regulations can be helpful in protecting labor against exploitative sector practices. The problem is they can also be counterproductive, so they need to be administered correctly. The Philippines needs a whole of society, a whole of society approach, combining upfront, quick acting measures with lasting solutions involving government, workers, private enterprises, and taxpayers. And achieving that whole of society uh, state is what we are proposing to do in this whole process of getting labor together with. Uh, with uh, a, a business under the oversight of government uh, to work out the proper whole of society approach. What are the next steps in this process? Okay, we have the problem of time inconsistency. Uh, and I think Dr. Pakea may have pointed out this out earlier. Okay, today's actions okay, can very well lead to tomorrow's regrets. Okay, if the problem of time con uh, consistency is not uh, properly worked out. We need to have a tripartite agreement on a well thought out social contract that links short term solutions and long term labor issues. We need to have a more cooperative process between labor and business leaders, especially res res responding with the challenges posed by the fourth industrial revolution in terms of the implications of that revolution for uh, labor in its current form in our country. This approach will be, only be, will be effective only if there is the support of other influential and thus what is sectors of society outside of the useful tripartite stakeholders. To give an update on where we are in this process, we've initiated that process already within the foundation. We've already concluded separate meetings with labor employer organizations and organized labor groups. Predictably, the, the positions are still far apart, although uh, most recently we've already received written position papers from organized labor. From organized labor no? Now, this written position papers are important because uh, these then become the basis for seeking consensus from uh, the employer side. So the next step, the first next step is to seek broader agreement on other perhaps unrelated issues that are raised by this written position papers from labor that may be acceptable to the employer side. As quid pro quo for this, labor, we believe, should be willing to compromise with employers on a middle ground on the key reforms that we've proposed. Okay. Ideally, ideally, this process concludes with a summit, a mini summit between labor and employers under oversight of the uh, relevant government agencies like uh, NEDA or DOLE. 
ideally, a, it, uh, the summit comes up with a new social contract that becomes the basis for new or amending legislation that we can propose to Congress and or for executive action. Okay, from the position papers we gathered from labor, okay, we believe that the following are acceptable on their face. And, and hopefully the, the audience will, will, will uh, think about these uh, proposals further. Number one, uh, they want public funding of infrastructure programs, generating urgently needed jobs. That, that seems uh, uncontroversial. Second, they want the preparation of a regular Philippine industrial and employment plan together with the current Philippine Devol development plan that is regularly prepared by our government. Thirdly, they want national import employment targets under the current Philippine development plan to be converted into sectoral or regional employment sub-targets. So we're pushing the uh, quantitative downward. Number four, they propose to create interagency public employment agencies under the local government units to replace the current public employment service offices or PESOs. Number five, they propose to subsidize the organization of informal workers by MSMEs, MSMEs especially within the MSMEs and the cooperative sectors. I should note that uh, formalizing informal labor is also one of our objectives in the foundation. And lastly, formalizing the informal economy rather. And lastly, uh, they propose to reorient vocational and technical education towards more complex work content. Obviously, this is related again to preparing for the fourth industrial revolution. There's another set of proposals from organized labor that we are willing to talk about provided certain conditions are, are, are uh, from our end are acceptable to them. Okay. Among them, the following, they propose a uh, massive unemployment subsidy and work assistance guarantee uh, program to be publicly funded. Okay, This is something we can live with provided Okay, we include uh, the proviso that this program must be made subject to the acceptance of defined and binding fiscal constraints, as well as possible face down over time as the private sector continues to recover from the current lockdown. They also propose, labor proposes, secondly, a zero labor force NEEP policy. Again, we can talk about that provided it can be made subject to appropriate recognition of labor productivity issues as well as employer rights under the labor code. Thirdly, they propose national and local employment guarantees. Again, we want to make sure that this is explicitly made subject to the reality of fiscal constraints. Number four, they uh, want to push non-market-based employment by the public sector and we just want to ensure that such employment is made subject to considerations of social costs and the requirement of net positive social returns so we don't get into uh, white elephant projects. Lastly, related to uh, the earlier set of proposals, they want to see educational and industrial planning for uh, the fourth industrial revolution. Okay, they want that to be put in place. Okay, we obviously will agree to that, provided labor is also open to other reforms related to uh, preparing for fire or for the fourth industrial revolution, such as flexibility on wage and tenure policies. Ito po ang give and take na hinihingi natin, okay, in furtherance of a common objective. Okay, what are the inputs that we've gotten from the Department of Labor? Okay, uh, in terms of our invitation to them to sponsor a labor uh, employer summit. Okay, on these issues. Okay. Uh, number one, on the uh, recommendation to uh, regarding Job Start Philippines, okay, the department supports the inclusion of displaced workers and other first-time job seekers. They note that expanding coverage means this program will no longer be confined to the youth. They remind us that we will need more budget in the in GAA, in the General Appropriation Act to cover the addition of beneficiaries and include more LGUs. Okay, they remind us that uh, FTJA Act Section 10 does not allow Job Start Philippines beneficiaries to employ benefits, their benefits, to enjoy benefits of the FTJA Act. The Act mandates that from a first time job seeker, no fees or charges will be required to be paid. 
The second issue that they have comments on from Dole is on the issue of apprenticeship, Dole had no thoughts on this except to say that the TESDA, which is the body tasked with supervising apprenticeship programs, is now under DTI and that the Department of Labor may have to submit information needed on labor market information. Thirdly, on a proposal for special economic and employment recovery zones, Dole simply points out that this might have an impact on the hiring of foreign nationals. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, uh, thank you, Dr. Vic and Dr. Uh, Orbeta for your presentations. Now, actually, uh, before we invite our discussants to uh, give their or share their thoughts on the presentation, I'd like to ask also the uh, attendees on what they think about the labor market reforms that we're proposing. So uh, just please answer the, uh, the survey and then we'll see. So the first question is for reform and apprenticeship and uh, job start laws. Do you agree, disagree, or you agree with reservations? And neither agree nor disagree. If you have reservations later, feel free to put them in the, in the Q and E later, and we can discuss. And also the second question: uh, strengthen uh, unemployment insurance, improve the portability of pension benefits. Do you agree, disagree, or agree with uh, pension benefits? Right. I hope uh, everybody has cast their vote. So at least we have uh, an, an idea also on uh, what the fellows, all the attendees and the fellows think about it. Okay, we'll be uh, letting you know of the result. All right, so I'll share with you the poll results. So actually, yeah, it's, it's pretty good. Uh, um, Mostly, actually, everybody agreed. So, in principle, it's uh, agree seventy seven percent, and actually, it's both seventy seven percent on on the reform apprenticeship and job start laws, as well as in the uh, unemployment insurance and the portability of pension benefits. So, for the twenty three percent who have uh, reservations, actually, this will make for a good discussion. And who more to uh, best uh, start the discussion? So, first, I'd, uh, I'll call on a uh, Congressman uh, Kimbo. Uh, she was also the proponent of the uh, the pension. Uh, reform. So uh, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Congressman Stella. And please, if you have uh, any questions or reservations on the proposals, uh, do leave your comments either on Facebook or on the Q&A portion of the uh, Zoom uh, webinar uh, application. So over to you, Congressman Stella. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Jobs, jobs, jobs are indeed the hot issue of the day. So I salute the FEF for organizing this forum. And of course, congratulations to the speakers, Dr. Babe Sorbeta, Dr. Vic Paqueo, and Mr. Gary Olivar for putting together an evidence-based and insightful proposal on labor market reforms. Last June, 2020, if you recall, the PSA announced an unemployment rate of 17.7%, the highest ever recorded. With the pandemic, we have seen massive job insecurity with businesses struggling to keep afloat. And although the unemployment rate has eased to 8.7% as of October 2020, statistics would show that many of those who previously lost jobs and subsequently found new jobs, unfortunately appear to be in lower quality jobs. The share of workers who are self-employed with no workers was at 29.3%, up from 26.7% from the previous year while the share of wage and salary workers has declined. Roughly half of wage and salary workers are employed in private establishments, only 43% of whom are in registered establishments. The rest belong to the informal sector. They, along with the contractual workers, who constitute 27.2% of private employees, do not fall under the scope of social protection programs and are thus most vulnerable in times of economic crises. This is the current situation amidst a pandemic, massive job losses, substantial shift to lower quality employment, and unknown but certainly high number of informal workers falling through the cracks with very weak social protection programs. The problem with our current labor laws is that it provides insufficient flexibility in employment decisions. It is perhaps this lack of flexibility faced by employers that makes agency hired workers more attractive 
than the red herring. This could also be partly why endo remains prevalent, subjecting workers to fixed-term jobs without benefits. According to PSA's Integrated Survey on Labor and Employment, or ILE, in 2018, 54% of the estimated 31,277 establishments with more than 20 workers employ agency-hired workers. These are the workers who are also vulnerable to endo. And while it is important to accord employers a certain level of flexibility for them to make efficient hiring decisions and maximize labor productivity throughout the course of their operations, there is an equally important need to ensure that this does not come at the expense of sufficient compensation, benefits, and social protection for workers. And this is the tough balancing act that is required. Of course, there could be legal solutions to the problem of lack of flexibility and its unintended consequences such as ENDO. Hence, I agree that we need a systematic review of all the pertinent laws related to labor. Moreover, these point to the urgency of a comprehensive and inclusive unemployment insurance program, especially considering the significant number of workers unprotected by existing social protection programs. Whenever there exists a level of uncertainty on the part of the employee, there must be insurance in place to help catch them for unemployment. At this point, I thank the speakers for taking a look at my House Bill on the creation of a national unemployment insurance program. The long-standing gaps in the, in the protection provided by the current labor code, coupled with the significant displacement we've seen during the ongoing economic crisis, point to the point to the urgent need to improve social protection through expanded unemployment insurance. Such a program can achieve two important goals. First is to provide cash assistance to displaced workers and preventing substantial reductions in consumption levels caused by job loss. And the second is support for job search activities. To be sure, there are existing programs in the Philippines providing unemployment benefits, albeit insufficient and inefficient ones. These programs are fragmented, non-inclusive, and limited. In July 2020, the SSS released about 76 million pesos worth of unemployment benefits, just enough to provide benefits to only 7,000 minimum wage workers for two months, certainly not enough to protect all those affected by the pandemic. All workers ought to be covered by a national unemployment insurance program. This will ultimately protect workers, especially during a general economic downturn. In cases of involuntary unemployment, the proposed program benefits will allow workers to sustain their current levels of consumption as they seek new work. Under the proposal, there will also be services such as job counseling, training, and retooling, in addition to unemployment benefits to help workers find the right fit in re-employment. Key to this program is the dedicated insurance fund, meaning not co-mingled with social pension as it is today. We also need a dedicated institution to manage it, the Philippine Job Insurance Corporation, which should be des designed to remain lean and efficient. I agree with the position of the FEF when it comes to the solutions necessary to improve the Philippine pension system, particularly on increasing portability across pension systems to limit friction for workers. The Philippine retirement pension is among the worst in the world, according to the 2019 Melbourne Mercer Global Pension Index. We are ranked 32nd out of 36 countries. When it comes to regulation and governance, protection and communication for members, as well as operating costs, the Philippines stands at the very bottom of the list. So this push to improve the system is very timely. Only about 30% of senior citizens in the Philippines receive pensions based on their previous work, such as contributory pension schemes. And this is according to a 2017 study. This leaves 70% that rely on our social pension scheme. Unfortunately, the current selection system of beneficiaries can be subject to many inclusion and exclusion errors. Moreover, it is highly politicized. So to help address this, I've also filed a bill to make social pension mandatory for all senior citizens. 
On the matter of special employment zones, I think that this type of plan could be implemented on a pilot basis first before it can be scaled up. I agree with the FEF that flexible minimum wage and tenure arrangements are worth considering. Tenure will be determined by competency programs or certifications. The government should also provide grants, subsidies, or incentives to employers who set up businesses in the special employment zones in order to attract people to join. My one concern is the following. Would this be redundant, considering that there are already existing special economic zones that also promote employment? In addition, the recently passed CREATE law introduces better incentives for firms that are found to engage in activities that have significant potential to create jobs. CREATE introduces a 50% additional deduction on labor expense a 100% additional deduction on training expense, among others. And such incentives will be partly administered by special economic zones. I agree with the FEF, FEF's points regarding the reform of apprenticeship and job start laws. First, training costs should at least be partly reimbursable to the government. A more proactive approach by the government benefits both employers and employees. Second, hiring after training should be dependent on mutual agreement. It should, it should be based on the employer's assessment of the trainee and the consent of the latter. This ensures quality control and a setup based on mutual consent. Third, training programs should not be limited to new entrants, but older individuals as well for greater inclusiveness. Learning and development must, after all, be accessible without prejudice to age and similar factors. More importantly, an institutionalized apprenticeship program, partly supported by government, is an important way to introduce flexibility in the employment decisions of, fir of firms and perhaps even address problems such as ENDO. To conclude, despite pending measures in Congress, there is much left to do for the labor sector. The necessary first step is an honest assessment of the situation which I believe we achieved this morning. So congratulations, everyone. The systemic issues we currently face have long been present, but concealed. The pandemic merely allowed an inherently broken system to rear its ugly head. Now that social, economic, and political ills have been amplified and have rippled across all sectors and classes, a challenge is posed to us to move forward together. The entire labor system needs not only minor reforms, but a comprehensive overhaul in order for us to address a very important obstacle to sustained and inclusive economic growth, low levels of labor productivity. Meanwhile, we need another round of economic stimulus. We need a Bayanihan three. Speaker Velasco and I filed a new version calling for a 420 billion peso economic stimulus package. The programs are intended to boost consumer spending, provide assistance to workers, whether displaced or employed, support capacity building among MSMEs, and aid farmers, livestock producers, so that food inflation can be stemmed. We need to prevent business closures so that jobs can be preserved. We need to prevent the permanent destruction of jobs in businesses that won't be able to restart. We need to catch workers as they fall through the cracks. Thank you for listening. Let's all do our share in creating jobs, protecting workers, and promoting value added in firms through improved labor productivity. Thank you, Congressman Kimbo. And up next, uh, I'll turn over the floor to ASIC to dive for your comments also. Good morning, ASIC. Good to see you again. Yeah, good morning, everyone. So to the members and advisors and trustees of the Foundation for Economic Freedom, Dr. Pacquio, Dr. Orbeta, and Sir Gary, fellow panelists, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, let me congratulate the Foundation for Economic Freedom for organizing this event, focusing on employment and labor market reforms in a post-pandemic scenario. The department highly appreciates avenues like this, which pushes forward private sector insights and initiatives on labor productivity growth, investment in human capital, government investment and labor regulations. We have been part of the initial discussions with the FEF last year and took note some of the suggestions, especially in generating more employment opportunities and also improving the employability of our workers 
particularly those who were affected, displaced by the pandemic, and our first-time job seekers. This is a timely effort as the government is pushing forward the recovery of our country from economic and social impacts of COVID-19. From experiencing what we consider record highs and lows in our key employment indicators last year, an average of 10.2% unemployment rate and 89.8% .8 employment rate, we acknowledge the importance of a whole society approach to bring the economy back to its feet, recover our losses in the labor market, and preserve existing jobs, businesses, and livelihood amidst the lingering pandemic. With this aim in mind, the Department of Labor and Employment in partnership with the Technical Education and Skills Development Authority, the Department of Trade and Industry, and various national government agencies signed a joint memorandum circular on November 5, 2021, that was just last week, which institutionalizes a joint task force on the National Employment Recovery Strategy, or what we call NERS, <clears throat> NERS, an expanded Trabajo Negocio Cabohayan blueprint for decent employment and entrepreneurship in the new normal. Anchored on a number of existing frameworks, such as the updated Philippine Development Plan 2017 to 2022 and Recharge PH, and the International Labor Organization's four pillars of decent work, the nurse hopes to contribute to the whole of society action plan on protecting and strengthening both businesses and workers as investments drive employment and that is instrumental in the country's recovery. <clears throat> the nurse puts the businesses and work workers at the center of the recovery efforts of D as DTI and DOLA believe that kaakibat po ng paglago ng negosyo ay ang paglikha ng maraming trabaho. In the medium term, we believe that DOLE programs on employment facilitation, support to micro, small, and medium enterprises, and sustainable livelihood programs will contribute to the recovery of the labor market back to its pre-pandemic situation. Preserving or preservation of existing jobs, businesses, and livelihood and adoption of a future-proof workforce responding to the market demands of the new normal. On a personal note, I am an advocate of flexibility in the labor market under the new normal and given the requirements of the fourth industrial revolution. But there must be constant retooling and reskilling a skill becomes a currency of the workforce in achieving employment and income security. With the government's commitment in containing the pandemic and safeguarding the interest of our workers and businesses, we are hopeful that the economy will continue to recover into a better normal and have a capacity to absorb displaced workers, re-entrants and new entrants to the labor market. The policy recommendations on skills development, unemployment insurance, creation of special employment zones are, and others are, are, will greatly contribute to the attainment of the intended outcomes of the nurse. Restarting economic activities, restoring business confidence, upgrading and retooling of the workforce, and of course, labor market access facilitation. So we look forward to further engagements and collaborations with our key stakeholders, the private sector, the labor and employer groups, the civil society organizations in the implementation of the nurse so that as one, we heal, recover, and enjoy the fruits of a recharged and reinvigorated labor market. Maraming salamat po and congratulations to the Freedom for Economic Forum. Salamat. Thank you, Asik Tita, and also for uh, entertaining our meetings with you also. And then uh, actually for, for the attendees, Asik Tita has also been helping us with the uh, feedback for the reforms since we started this. Thank you very much. So we have, you have a very well-rounded uh, group of, uh, of uh, discussants. So from the government, I actually turn you over now to the private sector. So up next uh, is a comment for, by Mr. Sayo. 
I turn over the floor to you. And Mr. Sayo, can you turn on your video? Thank you. There you can see you. Thank you so yeah, much. Hi. Good morning. Yeah, good morning. I, 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 I have a few slides uh, that, uh, that I would like to, just so I would be able to convey the messages that you wanted to say while, 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 the, while that is being prepared, I just like to thank uh, Dr. Pakeo, Dr. Arbeta, and Professor Gary Olivar for, for including us in this uh, forum. And my warm uh, uh, greetings also to Honorable Kimbo and uh, Asek uh, Niki for, for uh, involved, be, being involved in this. So uh, the, the way I'd like to handle our, our slides is uh, we we'll just go direct to the point. I don't have to read on it uh, as much as I can. I'll go directly to the main points that uh, we want to convey. Um, uh, basically, in the upskilling and reskilling of employees, we, uh, we are trying to, as much as possible, involve uh, enterprises. Uh, especially at this time when uh, some of them operate 50% uh, capacity, the others don't operate at all. But what we have done during the past uh, three years, uh, together with the German development uh, partners, was to develop in-company training. Meaning to say, uh, we, uh, we came up with, uh, with an ASEAN standard with which in-company trainers are to be trained, assessed, and certified. So uh, we've done that with other ASEAN countries under the auspices of uh, German cooperation and, and CIMEO and, uh, and, and other ASEAN countries. So uh, we are prepared to do enterprise-based training and the, the methodology for that, uh, we also developed together with TESDA. So TESDA has uh, something similar to, to their TM1, uh, the training methodology, which is very good. And we are developing a shorter version uh, because people are complaining about the 30-day program. So we want to come up with, uh, and we have a four-day program for, for, for in-company training. And then on the matter of uh, upskilling and reskilling, in as far as DOLE is concerned, what we would like to do is to have a mapping of the overseas workers that are here that ha have returned and that perhaps they're waiting for their, um, uh, for their next job or to be called uh, from their previous employers or to the new employers. What we would like to know and find out is if they can have uh, some sort of a profile of these OFWs where they are, what competencies do they, they have, and then we can find out if we can take advantage of the ladderized law, whereby, for example, those with engineering degrees, or I'm sorry, those with engineering courses taken but with no degrees can actually uh, go for this. Where we will do some, some support or help is in the setting up of assessors and certification processes, and of course, training in company, meaning to say, if, uh, if an OFW, perhaps 50 of them, 100 of them would like to pursue their degrees in industrial engineering, civil engineering, that they only have two years, two year courses, we will participate in the RPL component, in the recognition of prior learning component, whereby their experience in a specific field for five years, for 10 years, we can certify, we can assess and certify. So, that's what we mean by corporate social responsibility in this context, in the context of upskilling and reskilling. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Now we have our own challenges in, in um, getting enterprises to be involved in, in enterprise-based training. And as correctly mentioned by, uh, by the foundation, that only 4% of uh, total training is accounted for by enterprise-based training. And the reason for that is very clear and it has been mentioned, but foremost here would be the restrictive, uh, restrictive uh, components of the labor code. Employers are simply afraid uh, of, of training individuals because 
if they stay longer uh, and if it's not consistent with the competency that is required, for example, why will they risk uh, employing them if the if the competency that can can be achieved is only good for four months or five months, right? Most of the fourth industrial revolution competencies would take at least two years to three years uh, in mechatronics and 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 in and even in the digital digitally transformative areas or the Internet of Things. So uh, we we welcome the opportunity to work. Uh, on an industry and training and an industry oriented uh, training based on workplace training, if this can be achieved. Next, next slide, please. Getting somewhere. There, we, we did a study on the cost benefit uh, of uh, doing dual training, and we have proven that in the long term, the return is a minimum of 24%. So we have evidence based. Um, information to show that based on the survey of 342 companies that UP made together with Germany's BIDB, indeed the benefit outweighs the cost of training. So the private sector knows this as far as PCCI is concerned and as far as ECOP is concerned where, where I'm also a member of the board. Next slide please. Here, um, uh, let, let's go to the next slide about the validity here. This is the, these are the priority sectors that has come up. And what we did was we basically uh, surveyed several areas, the Philippine Development Plan uh, 217 to 222, the National Technical Education Skills, uh, Skills Development Plan uh, that was uh, uh, developed by TESDA, the NTA in their NTESDP, which incidentally is very good, uh, we submit. And then we have the Philippine Exclusive Innovation Industrial Strategy that, that was done multi-sectorally. And of course, the study by ADB uh, on the regional inclusive innovation centers. The regional inclusive innovation centers is something that's uh, that we support, that TESDA is pushing, and we are precisely uh, in the process of helping come up with the priority sectors. So um, these, are the com th these are the common sectors that, uh, that came about. And uh, you can see the, that the, uh, the common thread is digital transformations. These are ITDP, aerospace, automotive, uh, electronics, ITDPO. Um, Housing and uh, construction is also uh, mentioned, uh, especially when it comes to heavy equipment machineries uh, that has to do with uh, giving more impetus to urban development. Let me just uh, 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 give a glimpse of, uh, of uh, the food sector. I, I used to operate uh, four food factories in Mindanao after, after having been involved in San Miguel. And I can tell you, and one thing I can share with you is that uh, for the fourth industrial revolution is not a cohort of industries going from one phase to the other. In other words, you have industries that are, that are on their first phase, some are on their second phase, some are on the third and fourth, so forth. So for example, as an example, in food processing, we have uh, sun drying dehydration systems in Cebu. Most of them do sun drying because the slow drying of the sun makes the product softer, more pliable, more malleable, and, and, and good to eat. And then after putting it under the sun for four to six hours and calling it solar dried, they bring it to a dehydration equipment, which is um, for another four hours or six hours. Okay. Now that's dehydrated mango. Now, when we want to push our high value crops, uh, you know, Freeze drying, for example, uh, mangosteen, the higher value crops. We have a high cost of energy, and which is why, from a, from a product development viewpoint, why will I, as an investor, go into freeze drying? There's a market, higher value, etc. But my cost of energy is very, very high. So that's out of the question. That's fourth industrial revolution. But I would rather remain in the second industrial revolution, 
where I mix sun drying, solar drying with, with the regular drying. Uh, I am in a I am in the clubhouse, uh, so I can control the sound. But at any rate, um, uh, that's agriculture. We are very very concerned about the closure of a lot of agricultural colleges, and which is why uh, we in 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 my committee in PCCI we have the intellectual property committee. We hold uh, uh, an innovation contest every year together with DTI. And we have about seven to 80 entries. And we encourage the agriculture colleges to enter because they have a lot of uh, innovations in that field. So we put up a specific uh, uh, area for that. So all in the, all in the field of uh, solar drying, organic, uh, organic processing, et cetera. So that's, uh, I just wanted to emphasize that, that we have a strong chance because of the creativity and uh, the fact that Filipinos are generally hardworking, when, when, when it's something that interests them, then um, so uh, can, we, can we therefore uh, go to the next slide? Now, uh, we, we want to, when, when, we, when we start working on, on that technical working group for our, for, for, for our meetings, and, and in, in the left you would see uh, the the sectoral uh, the sectoral biases that we have based on our own experience. So maybe it's something that we also have to agree with BTI and Dole, for example. Uh, on, the, on on the right side, on the senior high school program, we have started influencing uh, the senior high school. You know, as as early as 2014. Remember when they added two years of high school, they and they added uh, four strands no, in, 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 in giving the senior high school the option. They have a choice of getting into sports. They have the, the option of getting into arts and design, and then, um, and then academic and technical vocation educa education and training. So we have actually put up a, a, a group at PCCI and ECHO to help influence curriculum development. And we use German, um, uh, German support systems in 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 uh, coming up with with me the mechatronics uh, courses also the the construction courses so um uh there's a lot of development in that field and there's a lot of uh, things that we that we can agree on because we know at the end it's all about productivity and competitiveness so these are all evidence based so uh, that's just what uh, we want to see in this slide next slide please so here, I want to reiterate that uh, one group that can help uh, in the assessment and certification process are our chambers and our echo chapters. So we will be able to have uh, assessment panels based on a specific uh, uh, field of interest. So uh, going back to the, to the joint program, which we want to have with Dole on the upscaling of the OFWs, if you can just tell us how many of these were, then we will organize our training, our assessment panels and certification. In other words, uh, most of them get the test the certification and most of these are TVET courses, single courses, six months, et cetera. So uh, we, need, we need courses that have more value added as indicated by the foundation, which we will co-develop with TESDA. Because TESDA, they have the wherewithal, they have the professionalism to do this. And uh, we have the experience and the, the, the market-driven approaches in making it happen. But, uh, but the, the skills mapping of the OFWs that are in forlow uh, should be done by Dole if possible. We will do the same for the alternative learning system, for the unemployed youth. But that's something with that, Ed. And I, I, I sit in the education forum and uh, I am discussing that with that, Ed, you know, as well. Next slide, please. So I discussed the in-company training. We have the standard. We have the, we have the online courses. We have the blended courses. So those of you who, who, who want to, who have institute, institutes or, or training modalities in your, in your, in your corporate uh, processes, even the labor unions, we can share this with you. We have the software, we have the, we have the trainers, and we can train your trainers. 
Yes, next slide, please. There we uh, we are, we're looking into into mixing of the practical and the schools based system. We 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 um, we acknowledge the influence of the German system here, but of course there are also other systems that, uh, for example, TESDA is uh, aware of the Australian system, the New Zealand system, and uh, we can always draw from the best experiences from all these. Next, please. Next slide, please. Is the, or is that the light slide? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'd just like to make uh, my last points. Uh, okay, I think I've said everything that I have to say. Thank you very much, uh, dear colleagues, for giving me the opportunity of, of sharing it with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Sai. So for everyone, for the attendees, if you have any questions also or suggestions to uh, to the comments of uh, Mr. Sai, he'll still be available later during the open forum. Okay. So next, uh, we'll have uh, Mr. Nebrao for his comments. Uh, Mr. Nebrao, please turn on your video. I turn away the floor to you. Thank you. Good morning. There you go. Yes, uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you, uh, FEF, and of course, to our esteemed speakers, uh, Dr. Pokeo, Dr. Orbeta, and uh, Mr. Olivar, and of course, even our uh, discussants. It's also heartwarming to actually hear Congresswoman Kimbo and Asset Tuyai of their updates and agreements to some of the issues and proposals raised. I'm actually very honored to join you today and represent our MSMEs on the discussed topics. As we know, 99.6% of our businesses in the country are made up of our micro, small, and medium enterprises, 87 of which are from our micro and small enterprises. This actually micro and small enterprises are supporting 80% of the vulnerable workers and non-public employment. Out of this 87%, 70% of these uh, MSMEs are actually family owned and, and or family run businesses. So therefore, uh, for our MSMEs, this is not just business, but this is about survival of our families and the communities that we actually serve. We are here to make sure that our workers are taken care for and are very much happy and contented, especially this time of pandemic. Our labor force are slowly coming from the generation of digital natives, where most of us are only digital migrants. So if you really want to embrace Industrial Revolution 4.0, we strongly agree with Congressman Congresswoman Kimbo and Dr. Pakeo to review our labor code and improve on it. I guess I just want to summarize that our call to action in the next two to three years as we face the effects of this pandemic will be two points. One, we really want to support the security of tenure. Maybe uh, there, there might be a repurpose of the roles, expansion of roles, but purely assure our workers of their tenure in the workplace. And the second point that I want to actually push for our call to action is to legalize and really create the equity incentives with and for our workers in the forms of A, long-term long -term, uh, performance incentives, second, uh, rotational work schedules, third, target-based incentives, and fourth, really champion the work-life balance for our workers. This way, we reduce free riders that jump from jobs to jobs. And oftentimes, that's the, the main uh, concerns of our MSMEs, of these uh, workers that uh, uh, only stay with us uh, a maximum of two to three years. We hope to really push our call to action and find a stronger voice as we rise up and as we rise up together and build a stronger workforce and more successful enterprise. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Nebrao. So that's it for the panel of discussions. Now I will move on to the open forum. May now request that the uh, the FEF fellows, uh, Dr. Pakeo, Dr. Arbeta, Mr. Olivar, uh, Mr. Saya, Mr. Nebrao, uh, and if representative team was still here, to please open your video and your microphones and unmute yourself so that uh, we can uh, facilitate the easy discussion. Thanks, everyone. All right. So it's good to see you, everyone. Okay. So um, I'll just be reading a few of the questions. So for the attendees also, if you have uh, any uh, questions, so please feel free. For those in the Zoom uh, app, uh, please uh, leave your questions in the Q&A. And uh, for those watching through Facebook Live, just please leave your comments on the uh, comments portion and then uh, we'll, we'll also transmit or we'll also read them out. Okay, so moving on to the questions. Um, a question by uh, by morning uh, Mahar uh, for this morning is, uh, what do you think or where in the reforms or when will the government also stop defining employment as speed work of only one hour per week? So it's a very important uh, definition. Also, you should also take into account. So anyone can uh, um, can take the answer for the government. Maybe uh. Or I see uh, ano, uh, Sec Gary or formerly in the government. Maybe you have also an input on... Uh, I was, uh, was, was going to defer to ASEC to tie, no? Mm -hmm. <laughs> if he's from Dolly. Uh, actually, unfortunately, um, ASEC Tutay also is, uh, uh, cannot... Uh, she has a meeting uh, and you cannot join the open forum. But uh, maybe to note also for our uh, presenters, maybe it's, this is something... Can I, can, can I suggest uh, we ask uh, Congressman a uh, uh, person... Uh, uh, Stella Kimbo, uh, she she already, she's, yeah. she's in Congress. She already left also. Oh, okay. Thank you, Can I answer that? Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, so, uh, uh, it's not the uh, problem of Philippine government. It's actually in, uh, in ILO statistics. Uh, it's a global definition that employment uh, for one is, is one. So, uh, and I think, and everybody knows that there's, that's a problem. So if we, if we change that, uh, the next question is how much, two hours, three hours? So that's an issue. So the, the but the employment statistics as, as actually has several, uh, you have uh, underemployment statistics, which actually measures people who, who are not working 40 hours a week as, an, as visibly under, underemployed. So that's, that's a complementary uh statistics to measure so there is no i think uh uh, uh real good answer to mars question uh and i think it's just by uh, global convention that is being used uh, so to measure poverty uh, to measure in unemployment uh, employment i should say should be, uh, uh, you have to use se the several if you have to know exactly what what uh, I don't know more uh, and which measure should include an uh, underemployment rate uh, as well, other than just employment rate. Just to add to uh, what Dr. Orbeta said, I think that gives a good uh, reason why SWA should continue uh, uh, measuring uh, using uh, its definition of employment, uh, you know, to, to generate a time series uh, data as a counterpoint to the official government uh, measurement. Uh, and, and I low in effect, the global measurement. Yeah, that's actually, uh, I think, uh, very relevant also for more for to for to really keep uh, important statistics. So when we talk about the unemployment, maybe a big factor also is under <laughs> underemployment, especially just one uh, paid works one hour per week uh, will barely provide for a family. Thank you for that. So um, I think uh, one of, this is an interesting question also. Uh, I think uh, Mr. Nebra would be uh, quite, uh, quite be inter interested also in this. So most workers actually don't aspire to be employees forever and they aspire to become entrepreneurs and even micro employers someday. So maybe uh, do you have any comments on, uh, there's a lot also that there's a lot of uh, too much uh, labor protection measures. So maybe uh, you'd like to comment on that also. Yeah, actually, sorry. Yeah, Go ahead. actually, uh, attorney. Yes, sir. Uh, 
Uh, actually, Attorney, uh, we saw that during the pandemic, most of those who were laid off were uh, going into uh, entrepreneurship. Uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, entrepreneurship activities being born out of this uh, pandemic. And we see that most of those who were laid off uh, now going into really uh, uh, putting up their own businesses. No? Kagaya nung sinabi ko po kanina, uh, uh, our MSMEs are... Uh, 87% uh, family-owned, family-run en en enterprises. And uh, uh, I think uh, that's uh, an area that is really growing right now. And uh, we're really uh, looking into how we can support entrepreneurship as we move along this area. Good idea. Gary, maybe uh, we can also tie this in for the zones. Uh, with, how, how do you think it will be also beneficial not just to employees but to future employers as well and i think uh, mr sai will also comment after you yeah i'd like to i'd like to make a comment on on that uh, that about the fact that a lot of uh, that there is uh, uh, a very high interest in, in 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 getting into entrepreneurship that's uh, during the pandemic that a lot of people were forced to go into it not to because they have to deliver their goods, they have to source, etc. But prior to the pandemic, the the there is a lot of obstacles to getting into entrepreneurship. Uh, one is the labor code. Uh, that's this is a survey that we that we that we did in 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 several locations. As a matter of fact, that's number one. Number two, the very intrusive local government units in terms of uh, local taxation. And local uh, policies uh, uh, to that effect. Um, third is the the difficulties in logistics. You know, every there's just too many too many stopovers if you deliver your goods and your products. There are many checkpoints. So you're 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 not only dealing with high wages. You're also dealing with structural inflation in terms of there are many middlemen that you have to deal with, and there, so. It's important to know this, and it is important to have a reality check on this, because if we are to to usher the 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 informal sector sector onto the formal, we have to we, we have to be clear why uh, why they want to remain uh, underground. So 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 those are just some of the some of the reasons, and in fact. Um, uh, uh, the, the name of the game in surviving in this business is to remain under the radar. Don't let the BIR notice you. Uh, if you if you can segregate your cost and your revenues in terms of uh, different companies or outfits. I mean that's that's how it has gotten to be. So let me just check that uh, misconception about uh, about the the impetus for for entrepreneurship. In fact. Uh, people would rather remain employed because of the security. Thank you very much. It's actually a good question by Noina Opla. So, actually, um, don't comment. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Can I, can, I, can I join the conversation on that topic? Yes, please. Talk. I actually um, have um, a slightly different view uh, than my friend Nonoy Oplas. Um, I think that uh, um, it is true, uh, and have been saying this, that uh, there is um, over-regulation in, um, in, uh, in, in the Philippines. And that has actually uh, induced um, uh, people to go to self-employed, to be self-employed, and to do micro-entrepreneurs uh, that have very low returns. Now, having having said that, uh, uh, I, I I think that the the, the idea of of uh, encouraging and uh, giving more freedom and enablement enabling environment for uh, people uh, who are interested um, and has the um, the uh, 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 appetite for risk taking, etc. I think that that should be uh, uh, developed. Now, my experience 
both in the fields and in um, uh, uh, doing research uh, on the topic of, of um, related to micro enterprises and um, like um, uh, negotio uh, um, projects that um, we find that a lot of people, and uh, it's not just a few, it's ha maybe be half, more than half of, of, of the population are actually uh, prefer to be employed. Um, they, they don't have the, the appetite for risk and, uh, or, or the, the, um, uh, the, the, the wherewithal. Uh, so I, I would be careful about saying that only uh, government uh, consultants, um, uh, labor union leaders uh, 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 are, are, uh, are interested, these are interested only on protection, protected, protecting labor. Reason for saying that I think we need to have a balanced appreciation of the need for uh, income security uh, because the market is failing and, and government has a reason to uh, 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 develop uh, systems uh, that would address uh, this, um, the, the need uh, to, to, to protect the population as a whole with uh, good safety net measures. But on the other hand, I think I, I acknowledge that, uh, and, uh, uh, that there is uh, over um, uh, regulations or, or there are a lot of uh, 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 regulations uh, that, could, that need to be modified because they are actually uh, uh, inducing unintended consequences at the expense of, uh, of um, in fact, uh, the, the employment of, of um, poor people and people with less human capital. Yeah, if, if, if I may just uh, make a, a very clear uh, uh, add-on on that, uh, on that note, uh, Dr. Pakeo. What we're seeing is uh, before the pandemic, we, we, we had this uh, over we had an over-regulatory environment. In fact, even with the passage of the Bambi Do, where very few people actually went into it and got out, or, or a lot were dissatisfied. What we are saying is, with the, with, the, with the move towards entrepreneurship during the pandemic, let us therefore not overregulate. No? So we, we should try to be as, uh, uh, as uh, you know, veering towards in, in incentivizing to let them flourish, to let them grow. And then improving the infrastructure, the, the support infrastructure for for uh, for Internet of Things. Uh, so so th th we have we have a clear uh, direction to have uh, a, a, a shift in the paradigm moved by this pandemic, and and I, I think we should we should be clear about that in all aspects of our advocacy. That's all. Thank you. I I agree with that comment. By the way. She said, she, most of the comments actually on the uh, Q&A box reflect this uh, kind of uh, opinion as well. And uh, she just uh, also, I think Mr. Uh, Edgar Bolister also made comments uh, for, for MSMPs. And actually one final comment from Ms. Uh, Florita Mambot. Manhot. Uh, actually, unfortunately, ASEC Tuta is no longer uh, in, the, in the forum, but this will be actually better answered. Uh, for SMEs affected uh, who wish to continue or start their uh, businesses, uh, maybe uh, what permits or licenses or capitalization is required, and can those businesses who wish to stop in opera their operation due to losses be allowed to uh, same as employees they have a leave of absence from operation while the pandemic is still existing, and that their existing permits and licenses would still be intact and there's no need to cancel. Uh, I think, uh, Ms. Mambot, um, um, as it to, there's a recent regulation also that uh, for, for employees, but uh, there's none yet for MS, MSME. So maybe uh, the, uh, for this last question, maybe the panel has some insights on how we can also fold in this concern from the employers. <laughs> so any uh, comments on uh, on the side of the employers, uh, like a possible leave of absence for yeah, actually, uh, 
Even Attorney, at- actually, uh, as far as we're concerned, there are uh, already uh, subsidies and uh, assistance coming from, uh, especially from our DTI and the SB Corporation that is being done for our MSMEs, especially those who have a uh, uh, staff operation. Uh, even BIR has uh, come up with three other regulations uh, giving them uh, incentives as far as just filing a zero income tax or zero uh, income for a quarter. And then uh, it's just like a prolonged absence in the business. So they're already being, uh, it's already being done. And uh, uh, even during the uh, pandemic, uh, we were given a chance to declare uh, those goods that are uh, expired and those uh, goods that we were able to also share uh, to our uh, different communities as uh, donations, in forms of donations and in forms of uh, helping out with our communities that we are involved in. So, meron na pong mga binibigay yung ating uh, especially for the Bayanihan 1 and the Bayanihan 2 that uh, Congressman uh, Kimbo was talking about. And now, of course, knowing about Bayanihan 3 would even be a uh, greater importance for for our MSMEs that uh, we can actually support uh, even our uh, uh, employment for our companies. Thank you. I think I'll be close to open for uh, for that. So final word also from our uh, panelists and our presenters. If you have any uh, final messages, or should maybe uh, ask for support also from the attendees to support FEF's uh, labor reforms. So any uh, last comments or let's uh, close the forum now. Yeah, Christine, if I may, I have to also go. Uh, may, may I just say? Uh, thank you very much. We 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 are looking forward to the to to the one of the um, the agreements during our previous meeting about the the setting up of the technical working group. Yeah. And uh, Professor Gary mentioned about the, the need to have an agreement on on the sectoral uh, uh, or, or the industries that we have to prioritize. And in that regard, it would really be good to have an agreement with the labor group. Uh, because there are developmental issues that would have to be addressed, and then and then there are of course hard hitting issues that would have to be agreed upon. So well, we 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 thank the foundation for spearheading this, and uh, uh, we are uh, uh, we we are there to support the programs as uh, as mandated by you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, if there are no final other words, I think I uh, will close the uh, the open forum. Thank you for the uh, panelists for giving their comments and for the FEF fellows for, for presenting the study. I hope that the uh, uh, the panelists and the attendees will also support the the for or the uh, reforms moving forward. Okay, for now. Uh, to close the memorial lecture, may I now call on FEF Chairman Roberto De Campo for his final remarks. Chairman Bobby, you have the floor. Uh, I think you're on mute, sir. Good to see you, sir. Uh, I think you may need to unmute yourself also. How's that? There, that's perfect. Thank you. Is that okay? Yes, that's perfect. Thank you. Go all ahead. right. Thank you, uh, Christine, and thank you very much to all the speakers. We've actually had the two sessions of speakers for uh, FEF Memorial Lecture for Varela Paderanga. The first one on the subject matter of agriculture, and the one today, which was an intensive discussion, not only of uh, labor issues, but also how to move the economy back from um, the pandemic situation and get, um, and, and, and get closer to a more normal situation for all our citizens. I just would like to indicate that it has been the FEF's position to present itself as an objective, analytical, non-political entity that occasionally, of course, provides 
positive criticism. But we don't just talk. We like to also bring ourselves to involvement. And therefore, we have been of assistance to many policy issues, including pieces of uh, legislation. I know that it happens to be the penchant of uh, possibly too many Filipinos to have a default position of constantly complaining, if not about the economy, then about the leaders, and if not the leaders, then the voters who voted the leaders. It is not our penchant to complain. We would rather look at what the situation is and provide our inputs towards improving it. Improvement, of course, does not happen in a flash. And therefore, it has to be done with constant attention to what the environment presents and to be able to step back and analyze it with the objectivity required. Even as we in FEF would like to position our analysis within the context of promoting a free and market economy as reasonably possible within the context of a reasonable set of needed regulations. Having said that, it is also the pride of the FEF to have members who happen to be of this mindset and therefore involve themselves in these issues and present well-studied and analytical papers, as you had just uh, witnessed in agriculture and labor, for the consumption of all. I'm sure there was so much content that was presented and one cannot digest it in one sitting. But of course, I understand that uh, these are going to be made available and therefore it would be interesting for those that want to delve deeper or want to continue the process of moving our country, as we like to put it, positively, incrementally forward step by step, whether those steps are baby steps or giant steps. We are proud, therefore, to have this kind of a membership and um, having a memorial lecture to two members who reflect the kind of values that we want to espouse and who during their lifetimes contributed positively to the development of our country and to the forward progress of our economy. It is with pride, therefore, that we have this series dedicated or named after two of our outstanding members who contributed to society and contributed their lives towards the betterment of our country. I thank all of you who joined us in this Varela Paderanga Memorial Lectures. I thank all the speakers who prepared extensively to be able to give us thought pieces and not just the usual general statements and uh, platitudes, but give us enough solid um, analytical work to be able to move ahead with specifics and some detail and a deeper understanding of the context of some of the issues that we face. So once again, Thank you very much and thank you both to the speakers, to those that joined, and my continuing uh, pride and gratitude of the membership of the Foundation for Economic Freedom, of which I am immensely honored to chair. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Bobby. And actually, it's the final surprise also, aside from the uh, closing remarks, we have a uh, the yeah, real final uh, closing remarks, I said. So our dear chairman will actually share his talent with us with the song performance. See our GDP drop and hate to see it fall. And for every point it drops 200 billion more. It's been dropping all year long. Hope it doesn't drop much more As long as we're locked together Can only pray for better See our GDP drop and hate to see it fall 
And for every point it drops 200 billion more It's been falling all year long Hope it doesn't drop much more As long as we're in this muddle You and I together huddle See our GDP drop and hate to see it fall It's raining, it's pouring Covid cases are spreading See our GDP drop and hate to see it fall And for every point it drops 200 billion more It's been dropping all year long Hope it doesn't drop much more and while we're in this muddle, you and I together huddle, see our GDP drop and hate to see it fall. See our GDP drop and hate to see it fall. See our GDP drop and hate to see it fall. Thank you so much, Chairman Bobby. So we have uh, two very wonderful performances in uh, both our memorial lectures. So again, thank you everyone for watching it. I hope that you actually join us also in the advocacy efforts. So it's both hashtag agri reforms and hashtag labor reforms. So before I conclude, uh, may I remind everyone of the following. Please answer the evaluation form found in the chat box. And also a certificate of attendance will be provided to those who may request or need one. And the presentation materials used today, so all the PowerPoint presentations as you saw you today, will be sent to your emails. So once again, uh, this uh, webinar would not have been possible without the support also for our sponsors and uh, presenters. So thank you to the support of Atlas Network. And thank you also to our major sponsors, Aboitis Ventures, Bank of the Philippine Islands, Manila Water, Meralco, Subdivision and Housing Developers Association, and Shandon. And special thanks also for our minor sponsors, Ayala Land Incorporated, Converge Realty and Development Corporation, First Asia Venture Corporation, Philippine Veterans Bank, Malate Construction and Development Corporation, Organization of Socialized and Economic Housing Developers of the Philippines, Philippine Wood Producers Association, Pro Friends, Regina Capital, Result Commercial Banking Corporation, and Stratcom Corporation. Thank you also to our media partners, Business World, Inquirer.net, and Inquirer Pop. Finally, we thank everyone, the speakers, discussants, and all of our participants for joining us today. We hope that we continue the discourse on meaningful reforms for agricultural sector and labor sector even after this lecture. So please feel free to contact us if you have any uh, words of support or comments to improve on our presentations. Stay safe, everyone, and thank you and enjoy the rest of the day. So this is Christine Alcantara, and I'm signing off, and I hope you have a wonderful week. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye.